my plan for today is to go over the basics for the holidays, see how long that takes, and then if there's more time, oh yes, there's a, there are like 13, 14 of you, and I haven't heard that anybody's not coming. So we'll see. Yep. Decently well, I know some of you very well, some of you I don't know at all. Mm -hmm. um, so to help me understand the group better, please put in the chat a number between zero and five. Now zero is going to be, I've never heard of things like Purim, and five is going to be, I could teach this class if you would just let me. <laughs> Why don't you put separate numbers for each? There is no right answer. Well, what are you going to say? But it is helpful for I, me to know. <laughs> and you're welcome to private chat me or chat to everybody. Um, so you just type it in and it will register. I typed in something. Do I have to hit a send or something? Yeah. Yeah, either a send or, or a blue do I arrow. Find that? Hold on. I see three dots here. I'm not quite sure. I just uh, you have to click there... on you have to click on chat at the bottom of your screen, and then that window will pop up on the right. I have the chat, and I type something in there. But is there anything else I press have center. to press enter? Press enter or return. Or return. Yeah, on a Mac. Do, do you see something for me? No. 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 Is there a blue arrow, Charles? It says to everyone. Yep. Right. That's and right. There says type message here underneath that. I, I typed uh, the mm -hmm. number. And then hit return. Return slash enter slash whatever. And, and then what do I have to do? Press hit return. Or enter. There you go. There it is. Yeah. Okay. Hey. Mazel tov. <laughs> <laughs> All, All right. right. Well, thank you for the, the tutorial. I learned a little, another detail of, of uh, Zoom. Charles, that might be the most useful thing you get out of today's class. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm sure I learned something. I mean, uh, I was exposed to my mother and father just celebrated the usual uh, holiday, as I said, the main holidays, but there was no explanation or reasoning why that's just what they did. And uh, of course I went to Hebrew school and I, we did these things, but there was no, at, at a young age, there wasn't much of a, an explanation behind it. Now that as an adult, it, uh, it would be uh, much more enriching to understand more the history and the reasoning philosophy behind it. Excellent. All right. Well, um, these numbers are super helpful for me because that means that I can move a little faster through the basics. Um, while I am explaining things, if there's anything where you want to know more about something, the why or the what or the how or the when or the where, anything that you want to know, uh, um, you should jump in and interrupt me. Um, you could try putting in the chat, but um, just ask a question and then we'll talk more about it. Um, because otherwise I will move through these things um, a little faster than I would otherwise if your numbers were all zeros and ones. So uh, um, let's start with the basics. The Jewish holidays are not, at the, are not the same day every year and they are the same day every year. So this year, Hanukkah starts December 10th, which is this Thursday evening. Last year, it was 11 days prior on December 21st. 
next year it'll be 11 days earlier on I think the beginning of December, maybe even into November. I haven't exactly checked. And then it'll jump back to the end of December. So they are not on the same day every year. And yet they are on the same day every year because on the Jewish calendar, Hanukkah always starts on the 25th of Kislev. The reason that it's different is because the Jewish calendar is a lunar calendar. It's based off of the moon. Whereas the American calendar is a solar calendar. It's based on the sun. It takes the earth 365 and a quarter days to go around the sun once. The quarter day is why we have a leap year every four years to keep everything in order. The Jewish year is 12 lunar months and month comes from the word moon. You add an extra O and you get month. So a month is a new moon to a full moon to a new moon. 12 of those is 354 days. That's a difference of 11 days. So a lunar calendar is 11 days shorter than a solar calendar, which is why the Jewish holidays go up 11 days every year. This is fine. And that's how the Muslim calendar is too. That's why Ramadan is sometimes in the summer and sometimes in the winter. Mm -hmm. But for the Jews, we have a small problem, which is that according to the Torah, Passover has to be in the spring. And if you don't do something about your calendar, then Passover will very quickly end up in the winter. So the rabbis knew a lot about astronomy and they um, figured out, oh, if every so often, every three-ish years, we throw in an extra month, that will knock everything back into order. It's technically every seven out of every 19 years, but it's about every three-ish years. So that's why the holidays move the extra month is Adar, um, which is the month before Purim, or the month that Purim is in. When there are two Adars, then Purim is in the second one. The reason that it's Adar that's added is because in the Bible, the Jewish calendar begins with the month of Nisan when Passover is, because that's when mm -hmm. we left Egypt. Just like the Muslim calendar starts with yeah. when we left, uh, when the Muslims left Mecca for Medina. Um, hold on, I'm getting some noise from Hebrew school. All right, I've muted them. Uh, um, and they're gone. Great, sorry, back to you. So, um, so because Nisan was the first month, it, Adar was the last month, and therefore they just were adding a month at the end of the calendar. Now our calendar starts with Tishrei, sort of like, why is there an extra month in the middle of the year? But that's why. Questions about the calendar, how it works. It is also important to know while we're talking about the calendar that Jewish days start in the evening and then the morning. And that's because in the story of creation, it says there was evening and there was morning the first day, there was evening, there was morning the second day, there was evening, there was morning the third day. And the rabbis are like, ah, I understand. Days must start in the evening and then the morning. And when you hit the next evening, you're on the next day. So Jewish days start in the evening. That's relevant for Shabbat, which we'll tackle next week, but it's also helpful for understanding things like Passover, uh, like Hanukkah. Um, and I'm being summoned for help in a breakout room. So. Um, yeah. no. No, read, read, put your eyes on the word. Look at the word. Hold on a second. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know why they're asking for help. Na, ta, mm. All right, back to you. <laughs> I'm very sorry about this, um, but that's what happens when you get the principal to teach as your teacher in a pandemic. <laughs> um, so questions about the Jewish calendar and how it works before we dive into the holidays. How often do you have that additional month? Seven out of every 19 years. So it's about every three-ish years. Uh, Seven out of 19, okay. 
So is the month like roughly like 60 days, uh, uh, there are like 60 days then, I guess? No, there are two months. So uh, a lunar month is 28 days? Yeah, a lunar month is 29 or 30 days. It's somewhere between. So some of the months are 29, some of them are 30. Hmm. So, so, I mean, I know that like Adair repeats, but roughly right. Adair 1 through 29 and then Adair 1 through 30. Again. Exactly. Yeah, but it's Adair 1 and Adair 2. Right. Okay. Yeah, a Dar one and a Dar two. So, like, you if you keep your birthday, Dar Junior, is that right? <laughs> no, oh. just a Dar Aleph and a Dar Bet. So, if your Hebrew month, if your birthday, if your Hebrew birthday is in a Dar, then I believe it's a Dar Bet that you would celebrate it or mark it. Whereas, if your Hebrew birthday is in a Dar Aleph, then you have the leap year phenomenon where like you can say really I'm only four years old when actually you're like 30 something. Uh, um, but you would celebrate it in a dar, like when it's not a leap year, when there's only one a dar, then everything gets combined into, okay. into regular a dar. Other questions? Yes. Thank you, Yosemite. Three, six, eight, <laughs> 11, 14 is Okay. How interesting. So we had astronomers going way back. Oh yeah. What, what is In that? Mich Hold on. Hmm? I'm trying to figure out what your comment is saying. The leap year of the 19 year cycles are in three, six, eight, the third oh, year, the sixth year, the eighth year. Okay. Okay. I get it. So like it's three years apart, then then two years apart, then okay. Yeah. Very. So if you're yeah. stuck on a desert island. Okay. <laughs> cell phone, you can you know uh, when to celebrate Yom Kippur and Rosh Hashanah. When when did they come up with this nineteen year old cycle date? You know? Why is it? Three, six, eight. Um, it took a long time to figure that out yeah. just by watching the cycles and the, it has to do with the <laughs> agricultural activity. And so, all, it also has something to do with uh, you want to make sure that certain holidays don't fall on Shabbat or, or things like right. that. Ah. So it used to be in the time of the Mishnah that they would look at the crops um, there was one rabbi in particular, Rabban Gamwell, who was known to be very good at this. Um, and he would look at the crops and be like, hmm, is it dry yet? Is it still wet? I think this year we need an extra leap year. We need an extra month. Mm -hmm. And they would use nature to figure that out. And eventually around, I want to say the 500s, maybe the 700s CE, um, in Babylonia, they they were like, this is silly. Let's just like figure out the math here. And they figured out the math and said it. And so like, if you go on hebcal.com, you can look up the Hebrew date for like any, mm -hmm. any day of any year because it's set mathematically. I, I would think at that stage, there were, there were astronomers that there were, that were measuring things for years and most of these civilizations said, and, and they were able to, and they were high, high, highly developed mathematics, and they had <clears throat> Arab, the, the numeral system that we use today, rather yep. than the letter symbols, and that made calculations uh, uh, mm -hmm. much easier. Yeah. Um, the other thing of note is that every 19 years, the Hebrew date and the English date coincide. Hmm. So I was born... <laughs> Uh, 38 years after the Israel. No. Um, and so my Hebrew birthday and my English birthday are both the same as when Israel was a country, was declared a country on Israel's Independence Day. Except that kind of breaks down uh, because the, uh, uh, the uh, civil dates are on a 400 year cycle and the and the uh, Hebrew dates are in a 19-year cycle, so they don't quite mesh. Like 
I was born on the first day of Rosh Hashanah, and when I was young, every, you know, once or twice it showed up, but it doesn't anymore because they've gotten uh, out of line. Interesting. He has had his birthday on Yom Kippur, though. Yeah. Hmm. But then, of course, I was born 74 years ago, so it's been a longer time. <laughs> Fair enough. So, speaking of the first day of Rosh Hashanah, let's jump into Rosh Hashanah. <laughs> All right. So, um, Rosh Hashanah is the new year. It literally means head, Rosh, of the year, Shana, year. Um, <laughs> On Rosh Hashanah, it is customary to eat apples and honey. So you could have a fancy honey dish. Oh, that's cute. Or this. <coughs> you don't have to. Frankly, a jar of honey and an apple would do the trick. Um, the the um, implicit agenda that I'm going to just make explicit right now is that to do Jewish holidays, you can spend a lot of money to get all the stuff, but many of the things you don't actually need to have the stuff. They just make it nicer. There's this concept of hidor mitzvah, beautifying the commandment, that things are better when you use nice stuff, but anything can get the job done. So like Kiddush on Friday night, you to drink grape juice, you need a cup. But it's, and it's nicer if you have a nice cup, a kiddush cup, but anything that holds liquid would do the trick. So I'm gonna show you all sorts of funny, all sorts of fun stuff, um, but you don't need to spend tons of money to get all the nice stuff. So uh, with that, back into our actual holidays. Um, the reason for apples and honey is for a sweet new year. Honey is sweet. Apples are a fall are a fall fruit. Um, there is a Sephardic custom. Sephardic meaning Jews from originally from Spain um, to have a Rosh Hashanah seder, which takes this concept of a symbolic food like apples and honey, and extends it to other foods. So, for instance, um, we just had Thanksgiving. Thanksgiving is not technically a Jewish holiday, although there's much that is Jewish about it, like giving thanks. Um, pumpkin is a symbolic food um, in the Sephardic custom um, that you can eat not only on Thanksgiving, but also on Rosh Hashanah, because you can make a pun, a Hebrew pun on the name of pumpkin. Um, it's kra, and that sounds like the word for rip up which is also crab, but spelled differently. Um, so we say that we eat pumpkin so that God will rip up our um, judgments against us. Um, and second pun, kra sounds like the word for to call. God will call out our merits before us, uh, before God, and judge us favorably. Um, so in my family this year, we had pumpkin pie for, thing, for breakfast on Rosh Hashanah because it was a symbolic food to eat for Rosh Hashanah. And you are welcome to adopt this custom. Yeah. Um, we also had life cereal because that is a new pun that we made up that we should have a good life. Um, but that is not a traditional simana symbol. Um, the nice thing about Judaism is that you can use the traditional customs, but also make up your own as, um, as they provide meaning for you as well. So. We say Shana Tova, um, which means a good year. That's the greeting on Rosh Hashanah because you're wishing somebody a good year. Um, sometimes people say Lishana Tova, which uh, means for a good year. Um, that is short for Lishana Tova Tikatevu, may you be written for a good year. Um, so, I tend not to say Lashana Tova because that doesn't mean quite as much to me as just wishing somebody a good year, um, unless you're saying the full phrase, but you will see it and you can do whatever you want. 
Um, other things, shofar. This is a shofar. Comes from a ram, stuck on their head. Uh, um, the other one. And <laughs> Uh, you can. This is a ram's horn. You can also get them from other kosher animals, like an antelope, in which case it's really long and curly. Um, a shofar sounds like this. Um, and it's supposed to wake you up. Question from Yochanan. Is the shofar part of beautifying the commandment? Or like... No. Oh, okay. So that's like... Uh, it's a... So... Hearing the shofar is the commandment. Having a shofar is not. So you can't just replace it with like a trumpet and fulfill your application. Correct. All right, thank you. However, if you're nowhere near a shofar, you will, you will be within the spirit of the law, but not the letter of the law, if you listen to a trumpet recording on Rosh Hashanah. Although that brings up other questions about listening to recordings for Rosh Hashanah. Um, but you know. It's supposed to wake you up, Justin. Oh, I was doing, um, <clears throat> I have uh, some Hawaiian heritage and I was like researching uh, Jewish Hawaiian traditions. And I, I had read that like, there are some uh, Jewish Hawaiians that they like do a conch shell for their shofar um, and do something kind of like that. Um, cool. I was just curious on on how that is. Um, yeah. so received yeah like how that fits into the tradition yeah. yeah so you're not supposed to use a horn from a bull because you don't want to remind god of the story of the golden calf where the jews got the ten commandments and then 40 days later like yeah actually we're going to worship a golden cow instead um that's not what you want to remind god of on the on rosh hashanah instead you'd rather remind god of um abraham being willing to um, sacrifice his son um, because you're so faithful and although there are questions about that it's that story is described as a test and there are some who say that Abraham failed the test because he did not defend his son um, the way that he defended the strangers of Sodom and Gomorrah and the evidence for saying that is that God never talks to Abraham again nor does Isaac nor does Sarah um, so um, one of the things that I do in Camp Shana Tuva with the kids on my holidays is I put Abraham on trial um, for criminal negligence. Um, and I, the kids get roles and they're the witnesses, like Abraham is a witness and Isaac is a witness, but the knife is a witness and the ram is a witness. And we've got the bait team jury and we put him on trial and there's a whole whole procedure. Um, sometimes then, he's found guilty, sometimes he's yeah, not. Yeah, I was going to say, does he get convicted? Because I sure would. <laughs> uh, depends on how skilled his, his the lawyers are. <laughs> um, so, so nonetheless, tradition has it that we blow the shofar. And the nice thing about Jewish traditions is that you can put it, you can take, there are different level, different meanings usually for them. So you can take the meaning of we're reminding God of how faithful Abraham was. Or you can take the meaning of, we are waking ourselves up. Um, so a conch shell would certainly do that. Um, just can't be kosher. <laughs> well, don't eat it. <laughs> right. <laughs> well, no, but he said that the, the horn right. had to be from a kosher animal. Right, so the horn has to be from a kosher animal. Um, it can't be kosher. So, <laughs> so a conch, so oh. I don't, yeah, I, I, like I said, I was just trying to do research. Yeah, on it. I just, yeah it's cool. It's an interesting custom. Um, thank you for sharing that. Um, I don't think it's a you wild can make, one, but like, you know. It's a shellfish, by the way. It's a, yeah. it's, out, it's, out, it's the outer exoskeleton of a, of a, uh, of a snail type. Uh, uh, so it's, it's, it's a type of mollusk. It's not, uh, I think. Yeah. Anyway, so it's not because so you can. Culture. It's like you know. So like you can make the argument that you could you could argue that you can't use it because it's not from a kosher animal, or you could argue that you could use it because it's not a horn. 
of an animal, so therefore it's a different matter. <laughs> yeah, it and be. the rabbis of the Talmud would have, <laughs> would pull, I'm fairly confident, would pull these exact same there arguments. There would be three pages in the Talmud devoted to it. And no, no right. decision. <laughs> um, so this is, this is much of, some of what I love about Judaism. Um, also with the different levels of meaning, um, custom and text can be compared to a seven layer cake or multi-layer cake that when you cut into it, into a slice, you see multiple layers that exist simultaneously. So you can have multiple layers of interpretation of text or custom that all exist at the same time. And sometimes you'll like the chocolate layer better than the raspberry layer, but you know, to each their own. So, um, and you'll else? find that customs vary from community to community. You mentioned Sephardim and their, their definition of what you can eat on Passover is much different. And then, and, and you know, we had a mixture of people in, uh, in, in our con the congregation back in Costa Rica because it was everybody. We had people in Sephardic background, the more Ashkenazi, the folks from Israel and, and all over. And everybody had their own customs. It depends sometimes on the types of foodstuffs you have available in the part of the world in which you're living. Yeah. yeah, we had we had a friend who would explain that why the Ashkenazi don't eat rice or Passover by saying, "Well, rice doesn't grow in Poland." Well, hmm. so <laughs> doing research on like the Pesach weight, uh, I know that back in the day, like way far back, they used to have rice on the Passover plate. It was like part of the plate. This is way before uh, the custom of not having rice at all. So. Uh, for different communities and whatnot. So yeah, it's it gets really interesting reading like the history of it. Well, still it's it's legal now, right? Well, the, well, the conservatives. Yeah, conservatives. The conservative, conservative movement ruled it legal, yeah. It's a good thing because I can't eat wheat. So I was mm. left with only potatoes to eat, which is not exactly yeah. a week long. Speaking of things made from wheat, um, tashlich. Um, tashlich is the custom on Rosh Hashanah where we throw our breadcrumbs in body of water to symbolize getting rid of our sins. Um, sin in Judaism, the Hebrew word is chet, um, which is an archery term that means missing the mark. So the idea in Judaism is that like you we're aiming to do the right thing and you missed the mark and did the wrong thing. Um, this connects to a text in Pirkei Avot, which is Wisdoms of Our Ancestors. Um, it's in the Talmud, um, where it says, do not regard yourself as an evil person. Um, so I, because we assume that we're trying to do the right thing and sometimes we mess up because we're human, the coming year it's a chance to clean our slate and try again. Um, Related to this is the idea of repentance, that on Rosh Hashanah, we think about the things that we've, the ways in which we've messed up, either our own personal traits or the people that we've hurt in the past year. And then between Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur, we try to make amends. Um, the idea behind this is that if a given year is like a TV season, you want to minimize the amount of drama that you're bringing from one season into the next season. So you want to start over ideally with a clean slate in terms of all the people that you've messed up with in the previous season of your Jewish year. Um, so that's why we have time to do that. Uh, um, we ask God for forgiveness on Rosh Hashanah and again on Yom Kippur, but God cannot forgive us unless we God cannot forgive us for mistakes we've made with other people until those people have forgiven us. Um, traditionally, you're supposed to ask for forgiveness three times, sincerely. Um, if a person still won't forgive you after you've tried three times, then, then it's on them, not on you, but you have to do your best. Um, speaking of well, one more thing about Rosh Hashanah. 
um, before we get to Yom Kippur. So, this is a round challah. Mm. Uh, um, we have two of them because there were two loaves of chal, two, there was a double portion of manna that fell in the desert before Shabbat. We'll talk more about that when we get to Shabbat. So um, you do not go like this and pretend to be Princess Leia. Instead, <laughs> um, we eat these uh, um, and the chala is round because the year is round since, you know, a year ago we were back at Rosh Hashanah. Um, the chala is also round because it resembles a crown and we talk about God as our sovereign on Rosh Hashanah. Um, that is one of the section, the extra sections of the service that makes Rosh Hashanah services so very long. Uh, um, so that's food related. Now going to Yom Kippur, uh, um, there is no food for Yom Kippur. <laughs> Um, because Yom Kippur is a fast day. The reason Yom Kippur is a fast day is because the Torah says that you should afflict your souls. Mm -hmm. uh, um, and the rabbis are like, what does that mean? And they figured out that one of the things it means is that you're not supposed to eat or drink. Um, other categories of things that count as afflicting your soul. Um, and the... I may have to take a break in a second to start moving children around. Um, other things that count as afflicting your soul include um, perfume, leather shoes, marital relations, and drinking. Um, there might be one more that I'm missing. Did you say leather shoes? Leather yeah. shoes. Yes, leather shoes. Yochanan. So I know Karaite Jews, uh, this might be tangential, they don't uphold the Talmud and rabbinic like ruling. So they, do they fast on Yom Kippur or? I don't know. All right. Um, I so assume they do about, something. What's okay. that about perfume? Not that yeah. I like perfume, I don't, but. Um, What is it about? Just around the group. Hold on. What? It is just around the group. It looks like I have different people in my group than I did previously. Uh, maybe you just labeled it wrong. Oh, shoot. I labeled it wrong. Hold on. This would be the time to take a break. Um, and I'll be back in a few minutes. Um, good catch, Tim. Um, a ruby answer. Uh, David Diggs, does anybody, did anybody watch Hamilton? I didn't how sure. Uh, so David Diggs is the guy who originally yeah, played did you see that? Thomas Jefferson. Um, <laughs> and he just came out with a Hanukkah song. The song, it's adorable. Yeah, so I, I just uh, posted it in the chat if you want to click on the link or anything, but it's, it's, it's a, uh, what's it called? It's like, I want a puppy for Hanukkah. It's yeah. Why, yeah, I want a puppy for Hanukkah. Yeah. He's, uh, he's Jewish. Yeah, yeah. I didn't know that until he, until he watched the Hanukkah song. Yeah. We saw it yesterday. We yeah, we saw it yesterday. Day. Yeah. We've been, we've been playing it at our house. We thought it was pretty cute. It's adorable. He's cool. Yeah. I think I'm going to get a drink of water during this break real quick. <laughs> Why'd you put the water on? How you doing, Amy? You enjoying it? Uh, 
Hi, Deborah. Hey, Ed, how are you doing? Okay, how are you? Good. Getting all ready for Hanukkah? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Will you get to see all the family or is everybody? On, on Zoom. <laughs> yeah, okay. You guys are healthy? Yeah, we're good, good. Good, good. Okay, I just watched that <laughs> part of it anyway. So cute. It's adorable, isn't it? The fact yeah. that he has little kids doing it. I'm not going to watch the whole thing, though. It's like four minutes. I have to go get more coffee. Yeah. It's very long. It's very long. Ed, what's the name of your cat? This one, this is, one is Pluto. It's Pluto. Pluto? Okay. Does he have a Hebrew name? No. Oh, okay. He's a, we had a, a gray cat before him who was super, super sweet, and he died really young. I'm sorry. And his name is Neptune. So when we got this one, Emily decided that, that we should name him Pluto because in, in Neptune's honor. You're just going through the planets? Oh, well, we have five cats. He's the only one in well, Neptune came to us with the Neptune name. And then we decided it was the planet that he was named for. Yeah, not the... <laughs> not, not the Greek guy. Not the Greek guy. Anyway, yeah. Well, uh, we have two cats that are named after the characters in um, um, Real, of Real of Time. And we have... Yeah, I need to... And, oh, let's see. Mario is named after Mario Dinobili, a character or a friend of ours. And uh, Jackson came to us with his name. And that's it, right? Do you have anybody else now? No. Our dog came to us with her name, too. Okay. I don't care. So that must be terrible to spend a year away from your your wife. Do you have family where you are? Or? No, no, I'm alone. Jeez. No, we do Zoom all the time. Yeah, well, we yeah. have a, we have a Friday evening Zoom, and I have some Zoom sessions with my grandchildren on the weekend sometimes. Particularly older ones, we discuss. Uh, the oldest is twelve. We discuss. Uh, he's interested in physics and. Uh, I do engineering, so we talk about that or whatever he wants to talk about. So uh, we we used to have the whole family over for dinner every Sunday, and so since we can't do that anymore, we have a Sunday dinner Zoom session every. Right. Week. Well, it, it, we started Friday evenings. Uh, uh, my son started uh, asking for that, so uh, we were happy to see that. That's another. That's another long convoluted story, but. Yeah, well, my, our daughter works um, until 8 o'clock on many Fridays, so we oh, do it on Friday. So Many years ago, we were doing Friday. We used to do it on Friday, like before right. my daughter started working yeah, until well, 8 o'clock on Friday. Yeah, it turned out better on the weekend. Yeah, Sunday works easier, because on Friday, we were I'd be driving home from work and have to cook when I got home, so. Yeah. What are we talking about? Sorry. Oh, family dinner, Zoom. Family, family gatherings. Things, family gatherings and Zoom in, in lieu of family gatherings. But the nice thing is that you can gather with family that's all over the place, you know. Exactly. I think so. with the Zooms, it's the first time the whole family's been together with the four four children and the grandchildren, all them all. We're all um, converging in one place at one time. Mm -hmm. that, that we haven't been able to do that in years. Yeah, they, they're, they're, they're scattered across the country. Yeah, I was afraid that the Zoom um, uh, Passover would be terrible, but it turned out really well. It turned yeah, out so, so, it so I mean, well. for for us, we like generally we're just planning on like her mom coming up and like her brother and cousin live up here in Chicago, so we were going to do all that. But then because we did it on Zoom, uh, her grandmother was able to get on. And then aunt and uncle in California were able yeah, to. Yeah, we had California, New York, and yeah. yeah, it was it was nice. It was the first time that we've had 
the California people for him. Uh, yeah. The New York, we were in New York once for, for right. Yeah, but yeah. And it's just yeah, also, it, nice. yeah, it is. And for us, all the young cousins, they're all between about 12 and even the youngest one, the most recent was just born a couple of months ago. So then they're able, they're able to see each other and identify with each other. And they say hello to each other on the, at least on the screen. Yeah. Oh, that's true. That's true. The, the kids in my family live all over the place. Yeah. Mm -hmm. my, my brother's only grandkids live in uh, Switzerland. So they've been, ah. they've been uh, FaceTiming forever. Right. Well, they used to go there a couple yeah, times. Yeah, they used to go there a couple times a year. They haven't been there in a while. No. Well, our granddaughter was supposed to go for um, her semester abroad to Switzerland so in the fall. That's this past fall. That didn't work out. Well, and our grandson well, was supposed to go to Israel in the spring. Well, last day in the spring, yeah. In the that, spring, that, and that, that didn't work that, out that either. Canceled. No. He was real disappointed. She, so was she. Yeah. Well, we just have to wait, do the best we can. Well, the, the problem with, um, you know, not having something like the, the semester abroad is living in a different country is good for people from the United States. Right. You know, because in, in, in Europe or whatever, you drive five mile, uh, five hours and you're in two different countries. So people are used to the idea that there are different um, cultures. Right. It doesn't happen in the United States. No, it doesn't. That's part it doesn't. of the problem. With I, I agree with you. Yeah. Even though if you, if you really, if you really need to drive around different parts of the U.S., you'll notice uh, there are cultural differences, but they're not as sharp as speaking it. Well, there's different regional dialects, but certainly not different languages and no, such a sure. short distinct. Yeah. So people wonder why the people in the United States don't speak other languages. That's because they don't have to. Except for maybe Spanish these days. Mm -hmm. There's two reasons. One, it's a large country, and every and the other the other reason is everybody's second language. Who's not an English speaker, their second language English is, is English. English, right? Uh, whereas for people who are native English speakers, the choice of a second language to learn is not as obvious. That's true. Too. Right, like mm -hmm. in uh, in Louisiana, a lot of people's second language is French. French, yeah. Uh, yeah. In like Texas, it's either Spanish or German, actually. Really, German? Yeah, German's a huge, a huge thing in Texas. Mm -hmm. um, so, uh, the, like a huge like Czech community and all that kind of stuff down there. Well, large people. immigrant population from Germany in the nineteenth century from places. Well, like a, Texas yeah. also has a lot of Asians, doesn't mm -hmm. it? Yeah, uh, yeah, during uh, the Korean War and um, the Vietnam War, a lot of the uh, immigrants uh, afterwards moved to like Houston area. Yes, Houston in particular has, yeah. 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 I think I, I wouldn't want to live there, it's too hot. Well, nobody lived in Texas until 50 years ago because- of It's the too hot. <laughs> air con until air conditioning became available. We have a friend who comes from Puerto Rico and she hates the the cold. I mean, she absolutely hates it. So I think if you grow up with it, it's it's what you expect. But, but she doesn't like. She likes it better here than in Puerto Rico, though. She's but a, Violetta, she doesn't want to. She has no. She owns an apartment down there. I know she owns an apartment down there, but you know it's hard to find work down there. Oh yeah, she can find work down there. So. Okay. So thank you for your patience with that. Um, I'm sorry that took so long. And uh, hopefully the last class will either stay in their own session for the last few minutes or they'll figure out how to move themselves. Uh, um, but let's talk about Yom Kippur. So Yom Kippur, there is no food. Uh, um, however, there, oh, well, let's talk about why there's no food first. So there's no food because as we said, break, afflicting your souls. Um, some, again, this has multiple layers of why this is the case. Some people say 
It's so that we show God how sincere we are because we are uh, um, hurting our stomachs or something to that effect. Um, others say it's so that we can focus on um, the prayers. Personally, that works for me much of the time, but not all the time because the rest of the time I'm focusing on my stomach. Yes. Uh, um, it always seems the, crazy to me. Other explanation and the one that works best for me, but you can do whatever works for you, um, is that the Haftor, the prophetic reading for Yom Kippur morning is from the prophet Isaiah, who says that God doesn't want a fast where you are not eating, but then being, um, being unjust to others, but rather, quote, this is the fast that I desire, um, and now I'm going to paraphrase because I don't actually remember the entire quote, um, to loosen the bounds of oppression and clothe the naked and feed the hungry and other such things as such. Um, so the layer, the way that of interpretation that works for me is the idea that um, that when we don't eat, it gives us a sense of what it's like to be hungry. So that when somebody asks us for food or for money for food, we are more likely to respond from a place of empathy having somewhat experienced that. We, we don't fully experience it because we know where our next meal is coming from, presumably, mm -hmm. whereas this person doesn't necessarily, but we've, we've experienced being hungry for more than a few hours. And so it makes us more likely to give generously, um, as it says in the Torah, that when someone asks you for help, you should open up your hand to, him, to them because they will always be needy in their land. Um, so that's the interpretation of fasting that works for me. Now, it is important to know that there is the concept of pikuach nefesh in Judaism. Pikuach nefesh means saving a life. And the idea here is that you can break any rule in Judaism except for three in order to save a life. Um, the three that you cannot break are um, murder of someone innocent, um, improper sexual things, which is defined as rape and incest and idolatry. Um, but anything else, if someone's, if you're in a situation where you need to break a Jewish rule in order to save your life or someone else's life, you do it. Um, and the reason for this is that in the Torah, it says, these are my commandments that you should live by them. And the rabbis are like, ah, that you should live by them, not that you should die by them. So, um, so as it says in the Talmud, you desecrate one, Shab one Shabbat in order to be able to observe more Shabbats, which was my motto for Thanksgiving this year. Um, you, you have Thanksgiving differently one year so that you can have Thanksgiving similarly in other years and similarly for Hanukkah. Um, so what this has to do with Yom Kippur is that if you need to eat or drink in order to take medicine in Yom Kippur, then you are Jewishly forbidden to fast. You have to have at least enough food or water to take the medicine. Um, and if you're in a situation where, where it would be dangerous to you if you were fasting, <sighs> then you drink or you eat as necessary. Uh, if you're pregnant, if you're nursing, if you are out in the sun all day, soldiers in the IDF, um, drink water under rabbinic permission. Um, they try to do it in such a way that it's just enough, just a small enough amount that it keeps them going, but it's not, quote, drinking, but they do it. Um, so, so you're not allowed to fast on Yom Kippur if, if it's a medical reason. After Yom Kippur, we have the breakfast. Um, and this can be all, this is all matter, manners of things, often including bagels. Um, I think that bagels, I, I like to say that bagels are a Jewish food because in Leviticus it says you should be holy because I, the Lord, your God, am holy. Um, <laughs> but there are probably other reasons why bagels are associated with Jews. Excuse me for a second. 
Hey, Tim. Hey there. I got booted out of my uh, room because my Wi-Fi crashed. I think my sister did as well, so I'm going to log back on. Oh, no. All right. There you go. Oh, thanks. Yep. <laughs> All right. Um, so, uh, um, questions about Yom Kippur. Is it also a tradition to wear white on Yom Kippur? Yes, there is a there is a custom, although not a commandment, to wear white on Yom Kippur, white symbolizing purity, because then you wouldn't see, because then you would be able to see the specks that of dirt that were on it, um, and we want to show that we are pure. Um, another reason being that um, traditionally people are buried in shrouds. And it's kind of as if we are dead. I know okay. people are. Uh, Excuse got, me. I only got one kid. Uh, I got Sadie. But we went over the whole thing. Okay. And she was doing good. Awesome. All right. Put it up in your, write, it, write her up in your uh, log and you're good to go. Thank you. All right. Um, Elliot never showed up, so. Yeah, he's still in class. All right. I'll pay you. Wait, what about the log? There's a reading log. Email me, yeah. email me and I'll send it to you. Okay. Great. Wait, can you send that to me too, please? Sure, I'll send that to you too. Oh. All right, thank you. Have a good one. You too. Have a good time. Thanks, you too. All right, sorry. Uh, um, other questions about Yom Kippur? All right, seeing none. Um, oh, you're ready to go to your moderates now? There you go. Um, iPad, who is iPad? Oh, Alan. Um, April, hold on. There you go. All right. Great, thank you. Okay, so do you, do you you're with him now, or am I remaining with you? You're done. Okay. Okay. We did a lot today. Great. Okay. Yep. See you Wednesday. See you Wednesday. All right. I want. Ah, Elliot. Hey. I clicked the wrong button. I was going to click to join Simon. Yeah, I think he left already. You left already? Yeah, it's eleven thirty. You'll try again next week. All right. Bye, Elliot. All right. Ah! Button <laughs> guard. So, this is for our next holiday. This is a Lulav. Um, it comes with an etrog, but we didn't get the etrog. The etrog is like a lemon. Um, all right, so, so on Sukkot, we take a little of. Mm. Hi, Mr. Schwartz. I, um, I wanted to let you know I finished, um, with Samson and Jericho wasn't here again today. So I'll write that in my notes. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye. And this high and the high scores are like, why is Mr. Schwartz holding a little love? <laughs> um, so <laughs> um, so the so on Sukkot we shake a little love because in the Torah it says you should take a palm branch and a myrtle and a willow and a citrus fruit, a citron, and hold them together. Um, now, there are different interpretations for why we do this. One is that um, these represent the, um, these represent body parts. Hold on. Yes? You need to get into. Um, I can't find my breakout room. You can't find your breakout room. All right. Um, let me move you to your breakout room. Let me see. Breakout room. 
There you go. Oh, thanks. Yep. All right. Leave this meeting. I just finished. Great. All right. Bye, Eli. Well, okay. So, uh, um, I'm sorry. This is must be frustrating for you guys, uh, um, but I and I apologize. So, the Wulov is straight like a spine. The willow is long like lips. The myrtle is small and rounded like the eyes, and the etrog, which looks like a lemon but wrinkler more wrinkly is like the heart um, and we take all of our parts together when we use them to serve God and make the world a better place that's one interpretation why we bring all these things together another interpretation is that the etrog has a smell and a taste the lulav coming from a date palm has a taste but no smell the myrtle has a smell but no taste and the will has neither taste nor smell. So we, so these are interpreted to represent Jews who know a lot Jewishly and do a lot Jewishly. And you've got some who are like, who do both or are both and some who are neither and some who are one and some who are the other. And you take them all together and only then do you have a complete Jewish community. If you just have the Etrog by itself, representing the Jews who know a lot Jewishly and do a lot Jewishly, that doesn't fulfill the commandment. You haven't done it right. You need all the, you need everybody together in order to be, have a complete community and do the thing right. So those are two interpretations for what we do, why we take the will of, and then we shake it in all directions to represent that God is all around. The other thing we do on Sukkot is we build a sukkah. A sukkah is a hut. Um, and we build it because the Israelites camped in um, portable shelters while they were swapping through the desert. Um, we also build it because Sukkot is not only a historical holiday, but also an agricultural holiday. This is when the fall harvest was. Um, and in fact, Thanksgiving is based off of Sukkot. Um, and so the Israelites, when they were farmers, would sleep in these huts by the sides of their fields so that they could um, wake up and get right to work harvesting the food and not waste valuable time schlepping back and forth from their fields. So two different reasons for Sukkot or for Sukkot. All right, what questions are there about Sukkot? Maybe just uh, some some more of the uh, guidelines on suko, uh, sukkahs, because I know that in the past I've lived in an apartment pretty much at all times, so we have to kind of build ours with the best we can. Sometimes it's on a balcony, sometimes it's indoors, which I know is technically not correct, mm -hmm. and, you know, whatnot on those kinds of things. And then I see people that have permanent sukkahs outside, which, you know, I feel for a temporary structure is a little bit different as well. And, you know, all these different kinds of things. So just uh, see yeah. if you can a little bit more over that. Sure. So a sukkah is, so it should have somewhere between two and a half and four walls um, and a roof made of schach, which is a fun word to say. That means stuff that was once alive um, but isn't attached to the ground now. Um, so depending on where you live, your schach could be bamboo, it could be corn stalks, it could be branches. Um, you could get the bamboo mats, which um, technically do the trick, but are a little less in the spirit of it. Although in full disclosure, that's what I use this year. Um, the idea behind the schach is that you should be, it should be at least 51% covered, but you should still be able to see the stars ideally. Um, so if you're doing this indoors, maybe get some glow stars and stick them to your ceiling. Um, there are limits about, there are hypothetical limits on how small and how tall a sukkah can be. Effectively, if you're making it for a person, 
um, you shouldn't have to worry about those because you'll be fine. Bye. Bye, Bail. Uh, um, yeah, I think people who use structures that are mostly standing year round, um, I would argue are within the letter of the law, but not necessarily the spirit of the law. Um, they could argue that it's kind of like an umbrella that like is folded up, but if you until you open it up, it's not really a functioning umbrella in the same way that like until you put the walls around it and the roof on top, it's not a functioning sukkah. You can make that argument, um, but it's not quite as temporary as if you start from scratch every year. Um, you can get a sukkah kit. Um, Rosenblum sells them. They're expensive, but ideally you'll use them every year um, or at least often enough. Um, but the commandment isn't actually to build a sukkah, it's to dwell in a sukkah. So if you go sit in the synagogue sukkah, assuming you're not endangering your life, then, then that's also fine. Um, you can also make graham cracker sukkahs, which is not going to fulfill the commandment, but is a whole lot of fun. Um, does that help answer your question? Yes, yes, it really does. Great. Other questions about Sukkot? So what is it supposed, what is, what is it trying to convey to us? Now you talk about Rosh Hashanah and you talk about Yom Kippur and there's, there's a, a spiritual uh, basis for that and why we're doing this to uh, celebrate the new year. It's a whole process of uh, repentance, asking for forgiveness and renewing ourselves and our relationships uh, and trying to make ourselves better. So aside from reminding us that it's a harvest, harvest season, um, it, it should be reminding us of something, a symbolic of something. And, and uh, I'm not, aside from the fact that you're saying, well, we, we were camping out in the desert and we use those to remind us of that, but is there anything beyond that? Or is there some, some of a deeper reasoning? Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. Um, so holidays have nicknames. Um, and Sukkot's nickname is Zman Simchatenu, which means time of our joy. Um, so there are a lot of explanations for this, um, 13 to be exact. Um, I did a whole class where I had to find all them. Uh, um, but the, the big explanations for this are that um, it's a time of, so some people want to interpret it as a time of our joy because we're like celebrating our closeness with God kind of like a honeymoon. Um, you might have misadventures, but you still remember them all fondly later. Um, and that was sort of our time in the desert. Um, it's also, there's also um, a custom of Ushpizin, which is inviting in guests, again, when it's mm -hmm. safe to do so. Um, and that connects to the idea of time of our joy because we're sharing with others. Uh -huh. um, Maimonides is, um, he is a, one of the major rabbis to know. Um, he lived in the 1100s um, and he writes, and he wrote a law code called the Mishnah Torah that like tried to lay out everything in a little bit more orderly fashion in the Talmud. Um, and he writes that a holiday where you are only celebrating with yourselves and not taking care of those who are less fortunate is um, not a holiday of God, it is a holiday of the stomach. Ah. <laughs> um, so Sukkot is a reminder of the, um, the importance of sharing with others, um, of gathering together with friends, but also taking care of people who are less fortunate than yourself. Um, and in fact, one of the deeper meanings behind Sukkot um, is it rem if Yom Kippur helps us remember people who are hungry, Sukkot helps us remember people who are housing insecure, who live in temporary shelters year round because of necessity, not because of choice. 
Um, there was a cartoon that I saw once in the Jewish newspaper where there was a little girl passing a man sleeping in a, or sitting under a cardboard box and she asked him, oh, are you celebrating Sukkot too? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, the, okay. So, so there, there are a lot of different meanings that you can take from Sukkot. Um, does that help a little bit? Charles? A little bit when you said sharing with others, but I, I don't, from my, from my recollections, I don't seem to sense that there's been any overt sharing, except you're gathering together with, let's say, if you're in the synagogue and you do that with the congregants, but when you say sharing uh, uh, with others, uh, it, it, it doesn't seem to mention people that are, 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 are have, have uh, scarce resources. You're happy that you're bringing in the harvest and you have this abundance, but I, did, I don't seem to sense that, so that's it helps somewhat, yes. It's That's fair. It's not the sharing with others who are less fortunate than yourself is not as ritualized in Sukkot uh, as it is in some of the other holidays. Hmm. Um, like it's one of the four main commandments in Purim, for instance. Uh -huh. um, and there's a custom on Passover of Mat, Mat, uh, Maot Chitim, um, yes. which is gifts to the poor um, so they can celebrate Passover too. Um, it's not as ritualized, okay. but you also don't have to dig very far to find that level of meaning with Sukkot. Um, so it's open so, to your own, your own personal interpretation up to a point then, because you're talking about you know, people that are lacking housing or the scarcity of housing. That's so I would say that's so in, in a modern context. So I was looking for some, but it's helpful, yes. Some, something you're looking for something more traditional just understand some of the tradition because clearly you yeah. can associate that yeah i think that's where the maimonides text is helpful because that goes back about uh, 900 years yes um yeah it's a question um and if anybody is interested i can send you my source sheet of why Sukkot is called Zman Sim Chatenu, um, Holiday of Our Joy, and you can dig through the sources and find other levels of meaning for Sukkot. Mm -hmm. Charles, um, also in the um, PDF that they sent out, like just in that first, you know, little paragraph or couple of uh, things, it's, you know, really just talking about the, like, like David was saying, like historically, as well as the harvest, just like the joy and gratitude of God, basically, like celebrating how much God has done for us, I guess, and like the good stuff that he's done. I think that's a good word, that you can be grateful, to remind yourself to be grateful that you, you know, that, that it doesn't necessarily, some, you have this abundance, you should be happy that you have it and be, what is it, for what is the source of that abundance? Mm -hmm. I can see that, yeah. Yeah. Thank, Thank you, you, Justin. Um, yeah, one of the big ideas in Judaism is having an attitude of gratitude. Um, so like the first thing we're supposed to say in the morning, traditionally when we wake up is thank you to God that our souls came back and we had another day alive. Um, mm. We say blessings before and after we eat traditionally. Um, so um, Sukkot is, is a time to be grateful for what we have and and that digs in, that goes back to the harvest custom of it, um, a little bit to the idea of getting out of Egypt, although it's a little bit more Passover. Um, but then you can take that into personal and personal meaning and action mm. steps as you choose. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, after Passover, sorry, after Sukkot, the eighth day is Shemini Atzeret. Um, and Shemini Atzeret is the day that we start praying for rain. Um, now, in Chicago, we don't necessarily need so much rain in October or September. Um, but the reason that we're praying for rain anyway, then, is because that's the beginning of the rainy season in Israel. Um, and we add an extra line into the Amida prayer through um, the first day of Passover, asking for rain to fall in Israel. 
um, so that their crops can grow. Um, so one of the levels of meaning that I take from this is it's a time to think about water scarcity, water scarcity. Um, and, and people like not everybody who happens to live next to one of the five Great Lakes. Um, so thinking about that and how we can conserve water. After that is Simcha Torah. Uh, um, and Simcha Torah is when we finish reading the Torah and we start again. <laughs> um, and there's dancing and celebration, usually with others. This year, not so much. See uh, pikuach um, nefesh, and it's it's a time for for thinking about how the Torah can make our lives better. Um, we read the same stories every year, but we are not the same people. Um, you've had a whole year's worth of experience since the last time you read the stories, and so you see different things in it than you did last time. Um, yeah, that's some Chator. Questions about Shemini Atzer and some Chator? I think, was it in this class that we talked about how uh, every year in the Torah, we're only reading like a third of the Torah? Mm -hmm. Was it in this class, right? Mm -hmm. And then so, you know, the next year we're gonna be reading a different part of the Torah. Although, I mean, we're reading all of it in one year, but I mean, it's just, the, you know, the different ones that we're reading on different mm -hmm. days, so. And so that, that's starting it over, correct? That's so. true. Yeah, that's the triennial cycle where you only read the first third every year, then the middle third every year, then the last third, and then you start over. Um, some congregations use the triennial cycle, some congregations read the entire portion every week. The full Korea, it's called. Are there questions or thoughts about Purim? Sorry, not Purim. That's the other half. That's the other festive one. Simcha Torah and Shemini Atzeret. All right. Seeing none, let's go on to Hanukkah because that's starting soon, um, Thursday evening. So Hanukkah. Uh, we have the story um, where the ragtag band of farmers for, for their freedom against the mightiest army in the world. Um, that could be the, that could be American Independence Day. It could also be the story of Hanukkah. Um, and then um, using guerrilla warfare and defending their homeland. Um, against the invading army, they managed to convince the other army that it wasn't worth it and they got their freedom. Um, so that's the story of Hanukkah. Um, later on, the rabbis decided that it was better to put some emphasis on God. So um, they came up with a story of oil lasting for eight days um, as a miracle. Um, the reasons I'm fairly certain this is a story and not part of what actually happened are because it's not in the first or second book of Maccabees, which were written around the time. And you would think that if it was that noteworthy that it would have gotten written down. Um, and the first time it shows up is in the Talmud, which was written 600 years later by people who are known to have a not positive relationship with the, with the Hasmoneans um, and who have an incentive to tamp down on Jews having military adventures where they keep getting killed. Um, so whether or not that story happened and is true, there is truth in it, um, namely that Sometimes it's good to have a little faith. Um, and even if you don't think it's go going to work out, maybe it's worth trying anyway. Uh, um, Rabbi David Hartman once wrote that um, according to the story of the oil, the miracle was only seven days because there was enough oil for one day. So, but the miracle of the 
the miracle is an eight-day miracle because they were willing to try it all. So that's that's the first day's miracle. Um, so there are those elements. Um, Arg. We light one of these, which is technically a Chanukia, but you could also call it a menorah. Um, menorah just means lamp in modern Hebrew. Um, and it, in biblical times referred to a seven branch lamp, not a nine branch lamp. However, menorah is much easier to say than Chanukia. So, and it rhymes with more things like Torah and Hora. Um, so, you know, feel free to call it a menorah as well, if you'd like. Um, this particular menorah was one that um, was my childhood one and my mother's childhood one. Um, and last year, my daughter started using it. Um, however, you don't have to have an heirloom one. You could also just buy one or get a piece of wood and some bolts um, and not bolts, um, washers. Um, and or hex nuts and make your own like my daughter just did this morning in Hebrew school. Um, yeah, my granddaughter did made in Hebrew school like both these many years ago. Yeah. So lots of options. Um, candles go in right to left and then you write, light them left to right. Um, you can use these. You can use smaller ones that look closer to birthday candle size. I've actually seen menorahs that are meant for birthday candles. Um, frankly, any candle will do the trick. Um, you can even find oil burning ones still if you'd like. Um, and the tallest part of the Hanukkah is for the shamas or the shamash and you use that to light the others. Yochanan? Left to right as you're facing it, or left to right as you're lighting it? Left to right from your perspective. So like right to left when you're looking at it from the other side of the window from outside? Correct. Okay, thank you. I, th um, I thought the yeah. shamash just had to be different. It didn't have to be taller. I think it has to be taller, but I won't swear to that. I, I, I've read that, but I've also seen lots of menorahs, Hanukkiahs that had the, the shamish down lower. Yeah, we have one. And and I can remember so my, my aunt having one that had like the shamish way down low and the other ones up high. So. Yeah. Right. Um, Yes, I'm not. I'm not sufficiently an expert to make a ruling on the um, cash route of those Hanukkiot. Um Technically, the other eight candles should be in a line, but I've seen Christmas tree Hanukkiot where it looks like a tree, and then you've got the candles up and down the sides, um, which is probably useful for certain, for some families also. Um, so there are lots of different things out there. Um, there you can also, so part of the idea of lighting the Hanukkiah is that you're publicizing the miracle. Um, so technically it should go in a window. However, if you would rather not burn down your house, you're also welcome to get an electric one and put that in the window um, and light a non-electric one if you so choose in a metal pan. Um, can I throw something out there? Um, I just I just read um, that uh, as long as the shamus is either higher or lower, so as not to be confused with the others. Okay. okay, thank you. Because the point the point is to just not confuse it with the others. Yeah. What, what what's your source on that? I'm just curious. I'm just trying to. Uh, I've got well, just about everything. Um, I just yeah. put in. Yeah. Does it have to be taller? <laughs> and everything from Wikipedia to history to. Um, a uh, Chabad, Chabad. Uh, yeah, so like they're all saying that the point is for it to just be different than yeah. the others. Chabad <laughs> seems to be a, a good source for some of these things as well. I've, I've been isolated, I don't have my 
any of my books with me. So I, I've gone to Chabad just to download prayers and blessings, and they give some interesting explanations uh, from a Chabad focus. So it's been helpful. <laughs> I'm they on, do. I'm on the Chabad site right now, and it's also saying that they that the eight candles need to be in a straight line, not set in a semicircle. Which I know I have ones that are, you know, mm. kind of a little bit different too, and then ones that they need to be at an even slant, not randomly higher and stuff. So I just didn't, you know. Just... Yeah. Um, yeah, that's that one. That we have yeah, there. my go-to source for internet Jewish stuff is myjewishlearning.com mm -hmm. um, because I'm fairly confident that I'm not going to get only an, an ultra-Orthodox perspective. Mm -hmm. Chabad has much good stuff on it um, and sometimes it can be hard to tell when they're only giving you their perspective when versus when they're giving you a normative perspective. Um, but if you're going to triangulate and say, oh, well, two out of three web Jewish websites agree, then they are worth triangulating with, I would say. Uh, um, also useful with a Fanukia is this. This is an orange peeler. Um, thank you, Yochanan. Uh, um, and this can be helpful for getting wax out. Um, boiling water also helps. Yeah, uh, I, use, uh, I use a uh, fondue fork. <laughs> mm, very nice. <laughs> Turn it around, it fits right in the little hole and you spin it around and it comes right out. <laughs> a little bit of aluminum foil in the bottom of the holder and then it just pops right out. Also good. Um, also on Hanukkah, we have the dreidel. Uh -huh. um, dreidel has four letters on it. Nun Gimel Heishin, stands for Neskid Ol Hayasham. If you're in Israel, the shin is a pay, because instead of a great miracle happened there, it's a great miracle happened here. Um, you find them in wooden form. This is what most of them look like, smaller, colorful, plastic, um, but you can find them in all fashions. Um, personally, I keep a dreidel in my pocket year round, but that's just because I'm a Jewish educator and you never know when you're gonna need a dreidel. Um, tradition says that the reason for the dreidel is that um, when the Jews were told not to study Jewish things, um, they would do it secretively. And if the Greek, Syrian Greek soldiers came, they would pull out the, put away the books and pull out the dreidels and pretend to be playing. Um, probably it's more of a Eastern European tradition um for something to do on winter on long winter nights um, they, just, they didn't know that a miracle had occurred at that time <laughs> right good point um not yet that's a very good point um also point i for, something i forgot to mention is that according to the book of maccabees the reason that hanukkah is an eight-day holiday is because um, the Jews were not able to celebrate Sukkot um, because they were fighting. So when they dedicated the temple, they cleaned it up and rededicated it. Um, they, did, it they celebrated Sukkot during that time, a delayed Sukkot, and Sukkot is an eight day holiday. Um, also the ded original dedication of the tabernacle and of the temple was eight days. Um, hmm. I see that it is after 12. If you can if you can give me a few more minutes, I can get through the rest of Hanukkah and then we can do the rest of the holidays next week and talk about Shabbat. Does that sound like that'll work for you guys? Yeah. I have no okay. appointments. It's <laughs> great. Um gelt. I forgot to grab some. Um, but gelt are chocolate covered coins. Um and the reason, thank you, Yochanan. Um, and originally, gelt was actual money. Um, it's, the, it's the Yiddish word for money. Um, and so children in Eastern Europe would receive a few coins with which to play dreidel. 
um, and or eventually put in Sudaka or maybe buy something for themselves. Um, but you got a little gout on, on Hanukkah, made the holiday a little nicer. Um, when Jews came to America um, around the turn of the century, the 20th century, um, the commercialization of Christmas was underway. And so Christmas was becoming a shopping holiday. Um, and then the Jews are like, oh, we want, we want presents too. Mm -hmm. um, so Indeed. then mm -hmm. presents became a bigger aspect of Hanukkah, um, not just a few coins of presents, but like, you know, toys and whatnot. Um, and since there were more days to receive them. Um, so, that's when gout, I believe, transformed into chocolate coins. Mm. Um, once the few coins weren't going to cut it anymore. Um, some families give presents every night. Some families give presents on one night. Some families have different, different relatives giving presents, 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 or um, they'll have like, different family members take a night and give presents um, within the nuclear family. Um, some families have a night where they go to volunteer at a soup kitchen or some other such organization. Um, and some families will have a night where they take the money that they would have spent on presents and have a family meeting to decide how they're going to um, give that money to Sadaq instead. Um, lots of different options. Um, the goal is that it's not just about the getting of presents, but also the giving of presents with that. Um, additionally with Sukkot, uh, not Sukkot. Um, additionally with Hanukkah, um, there's latkes. Mm. Latkas are um, potato pancakes. We eat them because they're fried in oil and oil was used for lighting the menorah, which whether you think that that was part of that, there was a miracle that happened or just that as the Book of Maccabees says, they had to light the menorah as part of their efforts of cleaning up the temple. Um, then um, oil was involved and so um, potato pancakes um, became an Eastern European food because potatoes, while they're native to North America, made their way to Eastern Europe and were cheap and plentiful around Hanukkah time. Um, so they make a good thing, as are onions, so they make a good thing to make a special treat of for Hanukkah. Sephardic Jews make sufganiyot, which are jelly donuts. Um, they originally were jelly, and now you can get them in all sorts of flavors. And so like, get some with sour cream, some sort of yogurt. They would, I know my wife would make them with yogurt. Yes. Um, so lots of, lots of different things that you can do, um, with food on Klanika. So with that, I will wish you an early happy Hanukkah. Um, next week, we're meeting again at 10.30, theoretically to talk about Shabbat, but we also have to get through the rest of the year. And then we'll talk about Shabbat. Um, so I look forward to seeing you all then. Thank you all for coming. Well, thank you for filling in some details and giving some more, um, putting a little bit more on the skeleton of what I knew. My thank pleasure. You. Thank you. Thank you. See you tomorrow, David. Thank you. Yeah. Bye. Bye. What do I do to leave? All right. Oi. Hey, Mr. Alpha.